Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Chili, and this is tutorial 15 of Beginner C++. Today we're doing Git, but before we get started, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes uh, to talk about where we're headed in the next two tutorial arcs. Now, goals are important. A lot of people start out and, you know, let's say they're in the MOBAs or whatever, and they just start out trying to create the next Dota, and they obviously fail because, you know, one does not simply start off creating a complex piece of software like that, and they fail and then they give up. Uh, now, at the same time, if you have no goal, or you only have, you only set very simple goals for yourself, with no bigger end game in mind, you might also lose interest. Listen to your mother, kids. Aim low. Aim so low, no one will even care if you succeed. You need some long-term goal or dream to keep you motivated while you're improving your skills. So what I'm saying is it's okay to have a big dream, but you also need to have some more realistic and, you know, maybe less exciting short-term goals to keep you going and moving forward. And, you know, every time you succeed at a smaller project, make the next one a little more ambitious, working your way towards the end game. So what are my short and long-term goals for this series? Well, you know my, my long-term goal, which is to teach hardware-accelerated 3D graphics programming. I showed you the basic roadmap in the intro video. Uh, but for a closer long-term goal, uh, I want us to be able to load bitmaps from files into memory and use them to draw sprites to the screen. And also text, which is just another kind of sprite. Uh, so we can say so long to those fucking massive compiled put pixel functions. Now in order to do this, we're gonna need to learn about file access, memory management, strings, and pointers, and those are gonna be the focus of the tutorial arc after this one. But before we tackle that stuff, the pointer arc, I'm gonna call it, uh, I wanna give you some skills that you're gonna wanna have when you're experimenting and creating games on your own. So in this arc, I'm planning on teaching you the following topics. Source control with Git, uh, floating point variables and operators, how to measure time so your game speed is independent of frame rate, and one other thing, uh, probably switch statements and enumerations. I might also teach you how the compiler actually works, the process of compiling and linking a, a program. Uh, now these things, uh, mainly the floating point number stuff, they're going to help you to make games and, you know, code up your own experiments, which you should already be doing by now to get that practice in. Now I will accept no excuses on this point. Nothing like, oh, I need to be able to load sprites. I need X, Y, Z. Then I'll start coding something. No, shut the fuck up. You need to learn to make do with less. Uh, we will get all those shiny tools eventually, but if you're not working with what you have right now and being creative, then you're only learning one lesson, and that's how to make excuses and lie to yourself. And that's a pretty shitty lesson to learn. This is Dank Chili. Peace the fuck out. So today's topic is source control, specifically Git. Now, you may be asking, Chili, what the fuck is source control, also known as version control? It's just a tool that helps you keep track of the history of changes to a set of documents. In our case, that's going to be a Visual Studio solution with all the source files and the project files. Uh, put in another way, it's a motherfucking time machine for code, baby, fucking sweet. Now, the next question you might have is, why the fuck should I care? And, uh, well, let me tell you something. I used to think that source control was like only for, you know, teams of coders working on a fairly large problems, heavyweight project. Uh, so what old me would do is, you know, I'd, I'd be working on something. I'd make changes, build, change, build, keep making changes. And down the line, I'd break something or I'd realize that the performance has gone way down. And then I would try to figure out what I did. What's the bad thing? And I would have trouble getting back even just to where I was before, let alone, you know, fixing the problem or getting making any progress. And I'd think to myself, I wish I had a goddamn backup. So over time, I started making copies of solution folders. Uh, every time I tried something new, every time I went in a little different direction, make another copy of that solution folder. And, you know, I'd, ha I'd end up with like fucking, you know, over 9,000 solution folders. And, you know, I could backtrack, but I'd often lose a lot of work. And, you know, there's tons of these directories clogging my, uh, my disk up, bad organization, just fucking a nightmare. Now the new me, I use source control, I use Git. 
It gives me a detailed history of all the changes I've made and it gives me tools to visualize that history. If I want to undo something that I did like two weeks ago, I don't have to undo everything back to that point. I can undo that one thing I did two weeks ago and keep everything I did after that. And I can create multiple branches of development where I explore different ideas without having them interfere with each other. Now, the common perception is that, you know, source control is only for advanced programmers, but that's not true. Beginners are the most likely to break shit when they're working, and they would benefit, you know, the most from having that safety net. And honestly, the sooner the better, the sooner you start learning how to use these tools, the better, because the world, the software development world, now runs on source control and mainly Git. Uh, now, other uses of source control are open source projects that are distributed online are usually distributed on a site like GitHub. For example, you know, Box2D or the Unreal Engine 4 or CryEngine or whatever. You've got hundreds, thousands of projects like this that you can build upon. Uh, now, the other thing is Git is, you know, it's an essential tool if you want to collaborate. So eventually you're going to probably want to work on it team on something and git gives you many awesome tools to facilitate you know different people working on the same source code at the same time and if you know git you can even start to contribute to open source projects you don't have to be a member of the team you can copy someone's code their repository make a change to it and then basically send them a message saying here's my change you know take a look at it if you like it you can add it to the project so you can be a part of developing open source projects you don't even have to be a member of the team all right let's talk about the basic ideas of git git revolves around something called repositories or repos and repos are just a collection of files or a database, mainly storing the history of changes to your source files. Repos can be local, stored on your machine or remote, stored on a server, for example on GitHub. But you don't need a GitHub account or anything to use Git. Now, a repo organizes the changes made to the source code in a timeline, broken down into units of change called commits. So here you can see uh, like a timeline of commits for this repository, for this, basically for this solution. In general, you make some changes to add a feature. Uh, for example, maybe you change something, a few lines in some code, maybe add some new files. Then you build it, you test it, and when you're satisfied, you commit it to the repo where those changes are lumped together and archived as a commit in the history timeline with a comment. Now, the power of Git comes from being able to browse, visualize, and manipulate this history of commits after the fact. All right, let's try to clone a remote repo. Now, one sweet thing about Git is it allows you to download the entire source code and the other necessary files for a project from a remote repo to your machine with just a simple URL. So I'm going to be using Git to distribute the tutorial materials from now on. Again, you don't need a GitHub account to be able to download code from GitHub. All you need is the Git URL. So let's try cloning some code from GitHub to our machine. Follow along for maximum learnage. Alright, so this is the page on GitHub for the repo that we're going to be cloning. Uh, it's called The Great Gitsby. And uh, I'm going to put the link for this page on the wiki page for this tutorial. Uh, so I'm going to go here. Now, this is the button you use to clone a repo. You click this and it allows you to copy to your clipboard the URL for the repo. And that's just this URL here. So, copy that. Now, you're going to open up Visual Studio. Blank Visual Studio. Don't open up any project. Just a blank Visual Studio thing. I don't think I have any solution open here, do I? Nope, no solution open. So, what you're going to do, you're going to click down here on Team Explorer. If you don't have this tab, you can get it by clicking on Team and going Manage Connections. So, you click on Team Explorer, let's say. And then you want to click on this Manage Connections button. I guess you could have done it from here, it doesn't matter. But click on this, it looks like a, yeah, looks like a plug. And click on Clone. And here you can put the, re the, uh, the GitHub repo URL. And here you put the, the path that you're going to clone the thing to on your computer. So I'm going to clone mine to desktop buttered pooper. I'm going to make a new folder and I'm going to call it Gitsby. And there we go. So we're going to clone to buttered pooper Gitsby. And click that clone button. 
and there you go initializing clone it's going to download all the stuff needed and it was very fast so we did it but where's our solution if you go to solution explorer you got nothing so in team explorer if you click on home first of all here you've got a list of local git repositories and the one that's bolded is the one you're currently connected to so you want to make sure you're connected to uh gitsby or whatever you called it and now we're connected here's our home and we're connected but we still don't see anything in the solution explorer so what you got to do is down here you've got a list of solutions associated with this repo you double click this and you open up the solution and now you see if we click on solution explorer we got our engine we can open it up and we got the familiar uh, framework stuff here of course you can also open it up by you know going into the folder and you know double clicking on the sln file but i uh, just want to show you a different way of opening up the solution now let's check out the history of commits so we go back to team explorer and we're at home we go to changes and actions view history and we can see the history of all the commits in uh in the current branch we call it i'll talk about that later but here's all the changes from the beginning of the repository up until the current state of the code now if you double click on one of these commits uh, you'll get the commit details and here it'll tell you a list of changes so a list of the files that have changed or here you can see files that have been added and files that have been uh, deleted will also show up uh, so you can get a list of the changes but that's not all you can double click on one of these files and what it's going to do is it's going to open up a, uh, a diff window showing you the difference between uh, the code after the commit and the code before the commit. So here we see that th this change here added a line in here. Note, rename to trim butt hair. You know, it's, it was a good idea at the time, I think. Uh, so yeah, you can do this and you can get an idea of what every commit has added or removed from the project. Now that's great, it lets us uh, see the individual changes for each commit. But what if we want to see the in we want to see a snapshot of the entire code at any point in time? Uh, well, to do that, what we can do is we can create a branch off of that commit. So what we'll do, we'll right click on the commit. Uh, let's go this one. And we'll go new branch. And here, you select a branch name. So I'm going to call this one branch. Michelle and we'll create that branch and now we've got a new branch Michelle and now we have changed to the Michelle branch so if I refresh this that's eh, no good uh, what I've got to do is I've got to go into here changes and view history because now we're in a different branch we're in the Michelle branch so here's the history for the Michelle branch it only leads up to the point where we created that branch point uh, and now if we look at the code here it's going to be quite different than the code we had before uh, so this is the code at that point in time and we can build it and run it and see that it is it is indeed majestic what you can now do is you can switch branches and jump to different points in time of your code so double click on master now we're back in the master branch like this and what i'm going to do is so for example for the poo game every tutorial every beginning part I'm going to put a uh, basically just a tag there and th the tag will look like this in the, uh, the Visual Studio window and that'll show you points of interest where you can you know right click and create a new branch and there you can uh, check the code out at that point you can build it and see how it works and you can use that as a starting point to code up your own stuff following along with the tutorial without messing up the main, uh, the master branch of code. I just want to note that sometimes in, especially in my older videos, you might find branches already in there, one branch for every uh, tutorial. And that was before I knew how to use tags. So I just put one branch for every uh, video. But now that we're using tags, you can just create the branches yourself. All right, so let's say you're following the tutorials, right? You clone uh, a repo and you do the tutorial and everything and sometime after you've cloned I add some new code to the repo for the next tutorial so that new code is up on github but it's not on your local repo yet it's only up on the remote one so what you've got to do is if you want to do that tutorial now you want to be able to get that code so you go to sync and there you can click on sync and that will synchronize with the remote repo it will 
pull anything new onto your computer and it will also try to push anything new uh, onto the remote repo. You can also do something you can fetch and then pull. Fetch is basically just checking to see what's there and then pulling is actually pulling it into your repo. And then there's push for if you only want to upload your changes to a repo. And we'll get to that later. All right, that's the bare basics needed to follow along with the tutorials. Uh, now let's look at something a little more substantial. So, making changes and making commits. What we're going to do is we're going to go into, doesn't matter, we'll go into some file here. And we're just going to add some, we're going to make some changes to the code. So we're going to add a comment in here. Oh, Doyle rules explanation mark and uh, so we go to home and let's click on changes and you can see here that your change has shown up here because we changed something in a source file you can also if you go into uh, solution explorer see a red check mark beside it here so this shows that something has changed and uh, so now you're you're happy with this change you know you've, you've tested it, it works nice you want to add it to the history of changes so you're gonna make a commit so you type in a message here. Uh, first off, let's go into actions. We'll view the history. So here's our history so far. We are right now in the master branch. Um, so we're going to make a commit here. We'll just say the commit is O'Doyle. And we're going to commit all. Any file that changes uh, that's being tracked is going to show up in here. So sometimes weird stuff will show up. Pay it no mind. So let's commit. And we've created a commit here. And let's refresh. No, we want to refresh this window. So here our commit shows up. This is the master at the uh, the GitHub server. This is our local master. And it's now ahead of the GitHub one. It has one extra commit here. And here's just the, the Michelle branch. Uh, so yeah, we've made our first commit. So let's go back into main.cpp. Let's make another change here. So we'll go, uh, you can do it. And yeah, we see it shows up here right away as soon as we start typing. Uh, so we got a change here. Now let's say we want to change branches. We want to switch to the Michelle branch. Double click. Uh, yeah, I'll save changes to that. Cannot switch to Michelle because there are uncommitted changes. So you cannot switch branches if you have changes that you haven't committed yet because you have to commit that stuff or they'll be lost when you switch to branch. Uh, so can't switch branches until you commit. Very important. So we'll just add, you know, very descriptive committing commit message here. And now that we have changed, we have committed that we can change to the Michelle branch if we like and note when we change here change branches that code disappears because this is a separate branch and likewise if we do if we add some comment in here and uh, changes and we commit that comment yes good we'll go to branches we change that is not when in the master branch so these two are completely independent of each other they share a history, uh, view history. Uh, you can't see you can't see um, Michelle in here now because it's actually diverged. It's diverged off this point here, and it's like this. But you can see that they share the same history from this point down, but they diverge, starting at this commit. But anyways, so let me give you a couple of. Uh, tips, a little bit of advice on making commits. First of all, don't work in a branch that's on the origin repository, the server. So here we're working, we added commits to master. Shouldn't do that. Whenever you want to change something, first you create a branch, like for example the Michelle branch, and uh, then you start making your changes. And I just like to say that from now on, all the code is going to be there, the whole history of any one solution. So for example, the poo game or whatever. So you're going to have the uh, the starting code, but you're also going to have the ending code all there. Uh, so the temptation will be there, you know, I just look at the end code, the finished product and say, man, I understand this, it's okay. But don't give in to that temptation. Make a branch and code along with the video or after you've watched the video. Try it out yourself. Don't just look at the end product and you know be satisfied. I got this. You don't got it until you've coded it yourself. Trust me. 
And if you get stuck, you can always switch branches and, you know, check out the finished product, see maybe where you've gone wrong. You'll always have that option. Now, the second tip I give you is commit often. So don't do like a ton of work adding like, you know, two weeks of work and then put one commit in there. That's, that's a terrible idea. Commit as small grained as possible. Don't like commit between changes where things can't even build yet. We've only half added a class or something. Don't commit at that. But when you've added a single feature and you can build it and test it, that's the time to commit. Don't start on a new feature. As fine grained commits as possible. That's what I recommend. The finer grained your commits are, the easier it is to isolate things and, you know, undo one thing uh, down the road. Whereas if you got a whole shit ton of changes lumped into one commit, you can't just you know isolate one of those changes now if you undo you've got to undo everything that you've done in that commit and from now on i will be committing as i live code during the videos so hopefully you'll get an idea of you know when and how often you want to commit and how you should break your commits up so like i said you can use the git history as like a kind of super undo to go back in time and undo problems and the way you do that is like let's say you, you find a problem up here uh you can start go back in time you can create branch points down here and test your code and figure out where things went wrong and then you create a branch point before there and you can just start from here and you can you keep all that code in the the, the bad the bad touch um, you keep it there for history and for maybe analyzing later on and you can start off clean from where things you know didn't go wrong now let's say you want to go back and you want to undo something, but you don't want to undo everything up to that point. You only want to do undo one thing. And maybe it's even in the middle of the history. What you can do is you can click on that. Uh, you can right click on the thing you want to undo. And you can go revert. And yes. And what that's going to do is that's going to add another commit that undoes this commit. So this doesn't actually get deleted from the history. This remains in the history, but a thing that undoes that gets added to the history. So if we go here, we get revert important comment added. So that comment, if we look here, let's look at what the change was. I added this comment here. And now if you look at the code, uh, let's go to sound.h we see that that comment has been deleted. All right, now one thing you might want to do is you might want to uh, take a project that you've already got, you've already started on it, and you want to now track it with Git. You want to do source control to manage the changes. So if you go to Team Explorer here, you'll see if you go home, this home is offline. You don't have any... There's no repo. There's no, if you view history, you can't view history because there's no repo for this code. All you got to do is you go here, add the source control, and there you go. It's in there now. And you go changes, you go view history, and here's your start starting history. Add git, git files and then add the project files. And now you can start committing, you can start tracking, it's all good. All right, let's get into some semi-advanced stuff here. Uh, so let's say now you have your project you got git all hooked up to it you got your uh, commits all in there you want to show off your code to someone you want to give your code to someone or maybe you want to get some troubleshooting help or debugging help in, in the planet chili community so what you can do is you can put this repo up on github where anyone can grab it then as long as they have the url so let's do this for this uh, local repo that we just created uh, for the snake game so what i'm going to do is I'm gonna go first of all so you go to your github page and if you don't have one of these obviously like I said you don't need github to do st stuff with git that we've done so far but if you want to upload a project to github then you obviously need your own account so this is your main page for github your account what you're gonna want to do is create a new repository and we'll just call this one uh, git snack and we'll add some nice description there and you want to keep all this stuff empty you can't make it private unless you pay money so make it public uh create your repository now you want to put your code upload it to your repo so you're going to copy this and you're going to go to team explorer home synchronize 
and you can't sync because you haven't actually connected to any uh, repository. So publish. Put your URL in here, click publish, and now it is going to publish uh, your master branch onto your remote GitHub. And now you're published. So you go back here. Uh, so let's refresh. And now you see we've got all of our files up on our uh, repository here. We can take this uh, URL, we can give it to someone, and now they can look at the project, they can browse it on GitHub. So you can browse the files like this. Uh, or they can clone it to their own machine and you know try to build it, maybe try to help you out with your problems. Now one thing you might want to do um, when you first start out is you go to uh, global settings and you might want to set your username and your email address. And if you don't want to give out your actual email address, you can give out one like this, uh, which you you can, yeah, that's that's fine. Users no reply github.com, that works fine. Um, but yeah, and when you, at the first time you try to upload to GitHub, you're gonna get a, yeah, you're gonna get like a login screen and you have to put in your credentials in there and you just put in the email you use to sign up to GitHub and uh, the password. And it'll only be asked that the first time you try to connect to GitHub. Now, one last thing I'd like to say is, let's say we create a branch, right? Which is what you should be doing whenever you wanna make a change. Uh, so you create a branch, uh, you know, new local branch from, and I'll just give it a dumb name like that. Uh, and now let's say we make a change in that branch. So now we're, we're doing our development code. We make some code changes. We run into some problems. We want to get some help. So first off, we're going to go to changes. We're going to commit our change. And this is going to be committed into the, uh, the branch that we made with the dumb name. Uh, so now we want to upload this to our remote repo. And so you might go, okay, well, I'll go synchronize and I'll sync. I can't sync, can't fetch, can't do anything. Hmm, interesting. If you look here, this branch does not track a remote branch. So branches that you create, by default, they are um, unpublished. So they're only on your local machine and they will not be uploaded until you right click and go publish branch. And when you do that, then they will be, the same branch will be created on the remote uh, machine and it'll be tracked and then you can go and you can synchronize and push and pull to your heart's delight all right now let's try one last thing here what if you have a repo and it's already connected to a remote repo this is a common situation because for example you're going to be cloning from the uh, the planet chili repo you're going to be cloning from my repo uh, for the framework but now you want to show someone your code maybe you want to get some help but you can't upload to the uh, to the repo that you're connected to the remote because that's mine you don't own it you don't have the rights to upload so you have to connect your repo now your your local repo to your own github account how do you do that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to clone a rep from a repo that i don't own uh so guy reductor he's a uh, guy from the planet chili community big supporter and uh, he's let me use his account here so we're going to clone one of his projects here we're going to clone this aeon profiler uh so we're going to go clone put the, re the thing in there we got to choose the local path so set that path up we clone it and we wait download finished we uh, we make sure that we're connected to it double click and then we open this up and there we go. So now we've got the solution opened or connected. Let us, uh, first things first. So we're gonna do the same thing that you're probably gonna be doing in your own workflow, which is first off, make a branch. Don't work in the master branch. So we're gonna call this one dev and make the branch and we'll automatically switch to it, check it out. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to make a change to some code. Doesn't matter what code, doesn't matter what change. There you go. And we're going to try to commit that change. So we're going to go to changes. Now, here is a, it's a, it's a dumb detail, but might as well get it out of the way. Uh, if you have a project that you've cloned 
and it is not properly set up for Visual Studio 2015, you're going to get these two files in your changes, uh, db and opendb. And these files are, they're not supposed to be tracked. The changes to these files should not go into the repository because they're temporary files used mainly by, I believe, um, IntelliSense. And they're very big. You don't want them going into your thing. And what's another thing is if you try to track these, your project won't actually work. So you've got to tell Git to ignore these files. And the way you do that is you go into settings, repository settings, you click, uh, where is it? Ignore file, edit. And you want to ignore this one? Nah, fuck. Okay, so I'm just going to go ignore star.vc.db and star.opendb. And save that. And if we save this, they disappear because now they're in ignore. Uh, and now we can commit these changes. We change the git ignore file and the text viewer source file. And if we do that, it says save and done. Good. All right. Now we've got our change in here. Now we want to put this change up onto a server. Uh, we can't publish this branch because if we tried it, what would happen? It's going to fail to publish because we, we don't own that repo. So we're going to create our own repo. We'll call it Dirty Sanchez. We'll give it a nice description and create the repo. Copy that. Now here's where it gets interesting. What we're going to do is we're not going to go into sync because we, we've already connected to a, a, um, a repo. We're going to go to settings, repository settings, and here we have the remotes. We're going to add another remote. And the name of this one is going to be my GitHub. And the fetch and the push are the same Dirty Sanchez. Put that in there. Now we've got two remotes. We've got the origin, which is a reductor's remote, the one where we get uh, the source files from. And then we've got our own GitHub. Now if we want to show our friend our dumb bullshit, we go to synchronize. And now, so what we want to do is... Uh, push to my github from dev push this branch onto my github now it's only going to go to my github it's not going to go to reductors thing and now we can push this branch on there and it's got to wait it's got to it takes longer to push than to pull because it's i don't know it's got to do bullshit but anyways uh so now we've pushed to my github and if we were we uh, refresh yeah we see all the file here all the files here are on my github and we can push our changes to there if we want to share them with someone and we can still pull changes from we can still try to fetch from origin if new things happen and we want to pull that into our code so if the origin repo gets updated gets improved we can pull those changes into our code and incorporate them all right, let me show you one last thing. This You just, ha you just have to watch for this one. Uh, so let's say you've got your code, right? And you got a problem. You upload it to your own repo. You give people the link. They check it. And they uh, they fix they fix your code somehow. Uh, what can happen is they can send you the changes by something called a pull request. And when they send you the pull request, uh, you'll get an email in informing you of it. And you can go here, you can check out the pull request, and you'll see, oh, here I've got one pull request from Reductor, and it's got a comment in it, and you can see the commits for the changes, there's two commits in here, and you can, you can view the commits, and you can view the files change, and you can see here, you see what has changed nicely highlighted for you. So, even if you don't actually merge this code into your own code, even if you don't add these commits, you can just look at this, someone can send you a link to this, and they can show you what you need to do to change your code to fix the problem. It's much easier than trying to explain, you know, in a chat or in YouTube comments or even on the forum. It just, they do the changes, they make sure it works, and then they send you a nice package that shows you everything that needs to be done. And you can actually, uh, you can have a conversation back and forth about it inside of GitHub if you want. And if you don't want to do the changes manually, you could just click, you know, merge 
uh, merge pull request and it will try to automatically do the changes for you. And this is basically how I imagine that the uh, the future of troubleshooting and debug helping on Planet Chile is going to work. It's going to work through GitHub because it's a much nicer in, uh, interface. And you don't have to worry right now as a beginner about how to send pull requests. You just have to know how to look at them. And this is how you do it. So that was GitHub. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. And it's how I'm going to be distributing the... Uh, the tutorial code and stuff from now on and if you want to start your own you know game or whatever uh, in the framework from a clean framework I recommend that you start it by cloning from uh, the Chile framework again I'm gonna put uh, the links to the stuff needed for this tutorial in the wiki as usual so you can check that out but yeah make sure you you start early and you get your practice in with github just these basic skills that I've shown you and uh, then yeah, later on you can try to explore the more advanced stuff if you like. But this stuff that I've just shown you, it's not that difficult. It always it has the GUI interface, so it's easy and it'll really, it'll really improve your workflow once you get it down. Alright, so I'm going to do something a little different for the homework since we haven't done any actual coding here. Uh, I got a little bit of a puzzle for you. I want you to get and download this this software uh i mean as you can imagine you, you're going to want to do it with uh github somehow but that's all i'm telling you i'm not going to give you any links i'm not going to give you anything it's kind of riddle can you acquire and build and run this program it's going to take a little bit of an in ingenuity maybe a little bit of research on your part but i mean give it your best shot and i will show you how to get this software and build and run it in the solution video for this tutorial. Until then, I'm Chili. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I'll see you soon with some more C++.